Another great day to be serving the Lord. Isn't this awesome? Well, I just got back from Orlando and we got Ashley and Carly Terridez here. Why don't you guys come up here and they spoke with me there. And I tell you, Carly was just on, well, Ashley and Carly were awesome. Both of them, Carly called out healings. We had over a hundred people come give testimonies. And then we've got a cure conference that's coming up. Uh, when is that? April 20th through 22nd. And this is their conference, but they're using our facility and uh, you guys need to be a part of it. So share a little bit about what happened in Orlando. It was awesome. Praise God. Andrew gave a great word and um, it was powerful. And then we spoke and uh, ministered. I ministered some on prosperity and the spirit of mammon. And then Kylie ministered on healing and faith. And man, we saw a lot of great healings. There was one guy, he had a metal rod. Kylie called it out from the front. There's metal dissolving. He had a metal rod in his back. And he came to the front, he said he felt heat in his back. And I said, how will you know if the metal rod's gone? He said, I can't touch my toes. I said, try and touch your toes. And he went right down, touched his toes. I believe the metal rod's gone. We had a lady had no cartilage in her, in her knees and she just started running on the spot and you could see her face just crying. And another guy got up on stage and I was worried. He said, I can't jolt my back for 20 years. I've had this back problem. He just jumped off the stage and yeah. jumping up and down. He did multiple back surgeries and uh, you know, it was funny because we had people come in, several people actually, that just came in with somebody else and they ended up having these miraculous healings and they said, well, I wasn't even expecting that. I just realized I was healed. Yeah. And the look of shock and awe on their face, it's like, yes, Jesus, got it, right? We had a number of people that were, um, came in with terminal diagnosis of cancer, um, stage four, uh, cancer in the hips and different places, pain throughout their body, all of their symptoms left. It was awesome. We had, well, I remember one lady, she was in tears because she could see. She had such bad uh, floaters that they were huge, basically. She couldn't see clearly at all. And she's like looking around, I can see, I can see that. She was, it was, and it was an exciting time. Was awesome. And we saw lots of people baptized in the Holy Spirit, didn't yeah. we? And, and salvations, it was powerful. It was awesome. So thanks for inviting us, Andrew, and uh, we're blessed. Let me, let me say this real quickly. Students, we were students in 2006, and um, this is God's A plan for you. So whatever it looks like in the circumstances, keep pushing through, and then don't take quitting off the table. I believe that God's called you here to see it through. He doesn't call you here to quit halfway. So finish what you started. And then one more thing. If you're not a partner of Andrew Romick Ministries, you should be as <laughs> students. How many partners of Andrew Romick Ministries are here? Yeah, awesome. Yeah, Praise awesome. the Lord. I almost asked who's not a partner. But I won't do that to you. But you can fix that in the break because these conferences are part of what your partnership does. We saw like 100 people healed and I think like 20 people born again and a bunch of people uh, received uh, the um, baptism in the Holy Spirit. And that was through your partnership. So thank you, partners. Thank you, students. Thank you, Andrew. Love you. Thank appreciate you. that. And so the conference on the cure, it, I'm one of the speakers there, but who, anybody else? Joseph Z. So it's uh, me and Carly. It's Prophet Joseph Z. Who's heard of Prophet Joseph Z? Okay, he's going to be ministering and, and, uh, and prophesying. And then uh, Brother Andrew's going to be there. We're really excited. It's here. It's going to be Thursday evening, Friday evening, and Saturday morning. And that's April the 20th to the 22nd. You can go to teradez.com, just teradez.com and find it, or you can go on awmi.net forward slash events and find it. Either way you can find it. But register, it's completely free. Register. Uh, we, the last one we had, we had in the springs, and we saw lots of healings, lots of miracles. It's called The Cure because it's a healing conference. So come along, learn about how to minister healing more successfully, and also bring your family, bring your friends, bring your enemies to get healed. And also, if you want to volunteer, if you want to participate in it and get some ministry experience just drop us an email you can do that through our website as well yeah yeah awesome love you appreciate you Thanks, amen Andrew. thank love you, you. <laughs> praise god and last year at the cure i was the speaker at the cure and they held it down at caris christian center in the springs and you raised i think it was five hundred thousand dollars wasn't it or something like that in in one night wasn't that awesome and uh i tell you They've already used it. It's gone. I'm blessed to be on their board. Billy and I both are on their board, and it's phenomenal what God has done. I think in five or seven, is it seven years? That you, five years. Uh, they have covered the territory that it took me two to three decades to cover. And uh, God is using them, and so great things are happening. Amen. All right, so in chapel, I've been teaching on prosperity. Today, I want to turn over to Second Kings or, or excuse me, 1 Kings uh, chapter 17. And this is the story of Elijah. And I want to focus specifically 
on uh, how he dealt with this widow woman that was in Zarephath and how that the Lord miraculously multiplied and supplied her needs. So anyway, I've got a great teaching on this entitled Lessons from Elijah. If you haven't heard that, you need to hear it. There's that sign when you first come in our property that says, Welcome to your place called there. And that's taken from this chapter that the Lord didn't send Elijah's provision to where he was. He sent it to where he told him to go. He says, I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. And the problem with most people is that they're waiting on God to send their provision here, but God's going to send your provision to where he told you to go. So your provision is in your place called there. And so after he did all that, the Lord fed him supernaturally through these ravens that brought him bread and flesh every morning and evening. You know, that was a miraculous supply. But how many of you are, are believing for something better than ravens bringing you whatever they find? <laughs> Even though that meant a need, man, I, I, I don't want to get my food from birds bringing me scraps that are roadkill. <laughs> and so in verse 8, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. You know, when you read scripture, you need to meditate on it. Most people just read trying to cover great amounts of territory, but you need to, you need to milk these scriptures for what they're worth and think about it. Notice he says, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. This changes this entire story. This wasn't random. This wasn't something that just happened. Elijah just didn't walk up to some random person and just pick her out. This was preordained. God had already spoken to this woman about sustaining Elijah. And hold your finger here because we'll come back. But over in Luke chapter 4, you find Jesus talking about this exact woman. He was in his hometown of Nazareth and they rejected him. And here's what the Lord said. Uh, in Luke chapter 4 and in verse um, 24, he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country, but I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months when great famine was throughout all of the land, but unto none of them was Elias sent uh, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sion, unto a woman that was a widow, and many lepers were in Israel in the days of Elysius, the prophet, the, and none of them were cleansed, saving Naaman, the Syrian. So his point is, he was defending the fact that he said that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and the people rejected him, and they took him out to the brow of the hill, and they were going to kill him, and he just supernaturally escaped. But before he did that, he told them, he says, look, there, a prophet doesn't have any honor in his own house and among his own kin. And to use a, an example, he said that there were many widows that went through this famine, but God didn't send Elijah to any of the widows that were in Israel. He sent them to a woman, a specific woman in Sarepta, which was, she was a Gentile. And so the point that he was making is that God uh, we'll reach out to whoever. And if the people that you know are closest don't receive it, he'll get somebody else. So Jesus made special mention of this woman. And this verse says that God had already commanded her. Now this is very important because this woman wasn't sitting at home just praying and begging for God to come through and do something. This is what a lot of people do when they have a financial need. They just start praying, oh God, do something. And they're in their prayer closet and they think they're seeking God and that that's gonna somehow or another cause them to see the supply. But God is gonna send your supply out there where you're doing what he told you to do. If this woman would have been in her prayer closet, she would have missed her supernatural supply. God had spoken to her and there was something in her that she knew that God was going to do something and that she was not only going to survive, but she was actually going to supply the needs of somebody else throughout this drought. So this woman knew this. This woman had a word from God. And in verse 19, it says, so he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, 
Behold the widow woman, not a widow woman, but the widow woman. The woman that God had already spoken to. And notice what she was doing. She was there gathering of sticks and he called unto her and said, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. So this woman wasn't at home just griping or complaining. She wasn't at home interceding. She had a word from God and she was out gathering sticks, which doesn't look like that's a great thing to be doing. It's pretty menial task, but it was just what she would have done on a normal basis. In other words, she still had one day's supply of food. You know, the Lord said over in the Lord's prayer in Matthew chapter six, give us this day our daily bread. That's God's will is to supply your needs day by day. But most of us want to pray for a year's supply or an entire lifetime supply so that we don't have to seek God anymore and we don't have to trust God. We could just do it one time and have him supply for us forever. That's not the way that it works. God wants to meet you on a daily basis. He wants to give you things on a daily basis. And so anyway, this woman had a word from God and she was just out doing what she would have normally done. She was acting like it was just a normal day. She was gathering sticks so that she could make a fire and cook this food. And so uh, Elijah came to her and behold, the woman, that exact woman that God had already spoken to was there gathering sticks. And so he called to her and said, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Now, before we go on with this story, let me just ask you, if a total stranger walked up to you and, you know, back in these days, um, man, they were, uh, there was a huge, uh, I don't know, prejudice by Jews against anybody that was a Gentile and vice versa. You can see that with the Samaritans and stuff. And uh, so anyway, there was this, there was this uh, ethnic uh, distance between them and yet Jesus or Elijah walked up and asked help from this woman, asked for a little bit of water. So let me ask you, if you had a total stranger walk up to you on the streets of Woodland Park or Colorado Springs today, and you'd never seen them before, and they said, would you go get me some water? Both of you would say, who died and made you God? Why don't you go get it yourself? And you aren't under near the stress that this woman is. The very fact that this woman was willing to go do what somebody requested of her, even somebody who wasn't of the same nationality and things. She later on says, you're God. So she recognized he was a Jew and that uh, he served a different God and stuff. And yet she was willing to go serve somebody. Again, this says something about this woman. There is a reason that miracles happen to some people and don't happen to others. And some people think it's just because God randomly just, you know, has a, uh, some kind of a drawing and you, your name just comes up and you hit the jackpot. There's a reason you can attract miracles to yourself. This woman was a giver. I believe that's probably why God spoke to her. She was not only praying about her needs being met, but she was praying about being a blessing to somebody else for this thing. And so he asked just water of her and it says, as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. So now he had gone beyond just asking for water. Now he was asking for bread and look what this woman said. And she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Now, again, most people take this verse and just say, well, boy, this woman had no faith at all. She was gathering these sticks. She was going to fix her food and eat it and die. This was a terrible confession. And I can understand how you could take it that way. But again, I go back to that ninth verse where the Lord had already spoken to her. She wasn't sitting at home just griping and complaining and praying and interceding. She was acting on what I believe God had spoken to her. I believe that you could take this as her just stating the situation, thinking, are you the one that God is going to send me? In other words, she just stated, like I've had people come to me before and they'll say, uh, how are you? And I'll say, I'm blessed. And then they'll say, well, I want to know how you really are. And I'll say, I, I'm really blessed. <laughs> and then they'll say, but how's the ministry doing? Do you have any needs? And I'll say things like, well, you know what? We're, we're building things. We need this. 
And you could take that as me just com confessing the negative that if we don't get enough money, there's no way in the world that I'm going to be able to do this. Or it could just be an explanation of the situation. You know, the Lord spoke to me a long time ago. This is back when we had 1,500 people total on our mailing list. And we were really struggling uh, financially. And uh, I just wouldn't tell anybody what was going on. And I had this dream. It's a long story. But in this dream, I had a partner come up and say, how are you? And I said, I'm blessed. And he said, how are you? I want to know how you really are. And I said, I'm really blessed. And he says, I want to know about your finances. Do you need anything? And I would have had to have literally lied to him not to state the situation. Right. And so I just told him, I said, well, in the natural, I said, we are really in a bind. We need help. And this guy got mad at me. This was all a dream. And he got mad at me and he said, I'm a partner of yours. God told me to help you and you aren't giving me the information that I need in order to be able to fulfill what God called me to do. And he got on my case and said, you need to tell people, you don't need to pressure them, but you need to give people the information to be able to partner with you. And so I woke up and I wrote a one page letter and I just stated the dream and I said, I'm sorry, I haven't been honest. I said, here's the situation, do with it what you want. I didn't put a return envelope in it, which is you know, typically what you do to make it easier to give. I didn't, I just told them, I said, you can do with it what you want to. And we had 1,500 people on our mailing list and we got $53,000 in like two weeks off of that one letter. And I learned a lesson through that. So anyway, you can, you can take what she's sta stating as a total negative confession, but that would be inconsistent with God having spoken to her, Jesus quoting and mentioning her. I believe that she was just stating, here's the situation. I'm down to my last little bit of food. And if I give you my last piece of bread, well, then we haven't got anything to eat. And I think she was just stating this to see, are you the one that God is speaking to about me supplying your need? So that's the way that I interpret that. I don't think that that was negative. I think she was just stating, here's the natural facts, but that's not what she was believing. And in verse uh, 13, Elijah said unto her, fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first and bring it unto me and afterward make for thee and for thy son. Now he didn't just ask something of her and that's it. He went on to say, in the next verse, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. So this is, you shouldn't just take from people. You need to give people the word of God. This is the reason that when I receive an offering, I always share something from scripture because it's not about my needs getting meant. It's not about just receiving money from other people. You need to give people a word and tell them that if you do what God tells you to do, that you're going to receive a hundredfold in this life. You need to give people a word. So he didn't just ask for what she had. He wasn't just taking. And, you know, this is what most people think about preachers, that all you are is after people's money. He wasn't after this woman's money. He was, he was her supply but she had to take a step of faith. If you understand giving properly, it's not taking from people, it's giving to people. Amen. You know, I came from Charlotte, North Carolina. Ashley and Carly have, uh, I used to go there for 32 years in a row and then I quit going and now Ashley and Carly go uh, every year in September to this church in North Carolina. And anyway, I had just been there, I think for five days, they gave me a 300 and something thousand dollar offering from a church of about a hundred people. And it was phenomenal. And so anyway, one of my Bible college graduates pastored up in the mountains here in Colorado and he asked me to come and speak. So I came straight from Charlotte, North Carolina and I, I landed in Denver and then I went to his church and he only had 30 people in his church. So he invited two other churches to meet with him. And so altogether, it was about a hundred people in this church and he knew that they wouldn't give me a very big offering and stuff. And so he just said, why don't you take up your own offerings? That way I couldn't complain if I was the one to receive the offerings. And so I took up the offerings and the very first uh, service, 
I got up and I said, look, I'm not a poor preacher that just barely got into town. And unless you give, I can't get out of town. And I'm not going to tell you what my needs are. I said, I just came from a church that gave me $300,000. I don't need your money. And as soon as I said that, you could just see all the blood drain out of this preacher's face like you just killed the offering. Because most people, when they give an offering, it's all about what my needs are. Would you please help me? And if that's the way that you think, then you're nothing big but a beggar, a Christian beggar. That's not what offerings are all about. It's not about you getting your needs, men. It's about you giving people an opportunity to become a partaker. It'd be like somebody walks in here and they got a billion dollar company and they say, I'm going to give everybody an opportunity to get stock at half price today and stuff. He's not taking from you. He's given to you. He's giving you an opportunity to invest. And that's what it should be. So anyway, I I said this and then I started teaching the people about why they need to give, not for my sake, but for their sake. Did you know that the next week, the pastor of that church called me up and he said, I don't remember anything you taught during the deal except those offerings. He says, those offerings touched me. And he said, I was so condemned. uh, I don't know if condemned is the right word, convicted that he knew those things, but he wouldn't tell the people that because he thought that they might think that he was just after their money. So he didn't uh, really encourage them to be a giver because he was looking at it that people would criticize him. So anyway, on Sunday after I left, he got up in front of his church and it was now back to just 30 people. And he got up in front of his church and he apologized. And he says, I'm sorry, I did not teach you the truth. I knew these things that Andrew was saying about the offering, but I was ashamed. I was feeling like I was begging for money. And so I wouldn't tell you. And he says, man, I was wrong. I am robbing from you. I was keeping you from getting the blessing that God has. And so he repented and he got on his knees in front of his church and he says, please forgive me for not telling you the truth about prosperity. And the people came up and started hugging him, 20 or 30 people in the church. And they said, we forgive you, pastor. And they started throwing money on the stage. And he took up enough money to pay off all the church indebtedness. I think it was $20,000 out of 30 people or something like that. And he called me and said, man, this has just revolutionized my life. See, that's what offerings are about. You aren't taking from people. Elijah wasn't taking from this woman. He told her. He says, you do this and thus saith the Lord, you will not want until this famine is over. You will never see your oil diminish, your meal diminish. God is going to supernaturally multiply it back to you. And I tell you, if you understand giving properly, you are giving people an opportunity when you receive offerings. You don't need to be apologetic about it. You don't need to act like, would you please help me? I'm a poor preacher. Man, go do something else. Beg on the street corner instead of beg in front of people. It's not about your needs. It's about people getting an opportunity to give and be a part of this. And so it goes on to say that she went and did according to the saying of Elijah and she and he and her house did eat many days. And I'll just summarize the rest of this for uh, time's sake, but it goes on to say that later her son died. And she came in unto Elijah and because she had been sowing into his life. And you know, this is andeology, but I personally believe that the Lord didn't take all of her meal and her oil and multiply it for three and a half years and give it to her all at once. I think on a daily basis, this woman only had a tiny bit of meal and a tiny bit of oil, just enough for one cake. And she had that every day for three years. And every day she had to put the prophet first and give to him first. And then when she went back, here was this multiplication. So she was trusting God and she'd been making a deposit into this man's life. And because of that, when her son died, then she was able to go to Elijah and demand Uh, demand in faith, not demand because she deserved it or because she was greater than Elijah, but just make a spiritual demand on Elijah. And Elijah went in and raised her son from the dead. So she not only got her need meant, 
She got to have a prophet stay with her for three years or however long it was. Man, think of the impact that was. That would have been worth a lot of money. And then she had her son raised from the dead. All of this came because a man was bold enough to say, you make for me first. I can just imagine the Jerusalem Post <laughs> saying prophet takes last meal out of widow's mouth, death imminent. They'd say something like that. And then when it multiplied for three and a half years and it turned out to be a great blessing and she got her son raised from the dead, I guarantee you they'd have put a retraction on the last page on the bottom someplace. But man, people just always are looking at the negative and thinking about things. Elijah wasn't taking from this woman. He was giving to this woman. He was her supply. Elijah was the man of God. He could have gone and stayed in the Hilton. He could have had his needs met. God sent him there for that woman's sake. And whether you recognize it or not, if a ministry is doing things properly, receiving an offering isn't just for them. It's not about them. It's about you getting an opportunity to give and to trust God. And man, you need to look at it this way and you need to take advantage of it. You know, I was at Greg Moore's church back I'm not even sure how many years ago this was, but 20 years ago or something like that. And I was teaching on this exact passage of scripture. And a woman came up after the service was over and asked for prayer. And, and when she came up, she says, do you remember me? And I said, no, I don't remember you. It turned out that the year before when I was at Greg's church, that she had come forward and she was in a mental institution as a patient. And she got out on a weekend pass to come to church. And she asked me to pray with her that God would restore her mind and that she'd be delivered from being a patient. So I prayed with her the year before. And when she came back this time and asked, do I recognize her? I didn't even recognize her. The woman was totally changed. I mean, she looked different. And uh, so she said, I'm that woman that you prayed for and I've been released. I'm no longer a patient. God set her free. But she was the janitor at the mental institution and they gave her a room. So she wasn't a patient, but she was still living there with all of the other patients. And she says, I want to get out of this place. And she says, I want a new place to live and a better job. Would you pray with me? Well, I had just taught on this passage of scripture. And so I asked this woman, I said, what do you have? And so she went back to her purse and she got this little coin purse and she had $78 and something like 53 cents. It was $78 and something. And I said, give it to me. And she said, all of it. And I said, all of it. And I held my hands out and she just dumped that uh, into my hands. And I took every penny that this woman had. And lest people would sit there and criticize me and think that I was doing this for myself, I turned around and in front of all the people, I gave the money to Pastor Greg and said, here, this is for your church. It's not for me. And I took every penny that that woman had and then I prayed with her. Did you know the next week Greg called me and he says, you aren't going to believe what happened to that woman. But this was on Sunday that I ministered to her. On Monday, a person who was a Christian, but he, he didn't go to that church. He didn't know what had happened. He came and just gave this woman a car. She had had been having to walk or take public transportation everywhere she went. And he gave her a car. It wasn't a brand new car, but it was new to her and it was a good car. He just gave her a car. She didn't even ask for that. And on Wednesday, her mother called out of the blue and her mother hadn't talked to her for years because she was in a mental institution and her mother was... Uh, ashamed of her. And her mother just out of the blue called, found out that she had been released from the mental hospital and the mother apologized and said, would you please move back home and we would like to restore relationships. So she got her new place to live, which was one of her requests, plus got a relationship with her mother put back together. And by Friday, she had a job that was paying her twice as much money as she was making being a janitor at the mental institution. All of that because we took from her. We weren't taken from her. When you give, when you understand, when you let go of money, it doesn't leave your life. It just enters into your future where it grows and multiplies. You're planting seed. 
And someday you'll be able to go reap the harvest of those seeds and it'll feed you. But if you eat everything that you've got, you may be full that day, but you're going to be hungry in the future. You need to recognize that, man, it is absolutely essential for you to be a giver. The Lord had already spoken to this woman. But how was he going to supply her need? It wasn't about her just receiving. Every single day she had to give. She had to put the man of God first. She had to put God first every single day. And I tell you, because she did that, God not only supplied her need, but raised her son from the dead. She got to uh, be around a man of God, a prophet of God that called fire down out of heaven that shook the entire nation became a personal friend. All of that was through him taking from her. Boy, if you understand this properly, giving is an inroad. It's a door to all kinds of things. And if you can't do that which is least, you will not be able to do that which is greatest. And there's some people that are trying to believe for healing. I was talking to someone yesterday that Man, they, died, they nearly died on the phone when I was talking with them and they're fighting for their life. And uh, I guarantee you, standing in healing is much, much more important than finances. If you can't trust God in the area of finances, I think you're deceiving yourself to think that you can trust God for healing, for deliverance, for vision being fulfilled and on and on you could go. This is the least use of your faith. So you need to start trusting God and recognizing that this isn't taking from you, it's giving to you. Man, that's awesome. That is awesome. You know, I've had people give things to me that I don't need it. And uh, there's times, you know, Jamie, she said something like, we don't need this. Why don't you turn this down? It's not about my needs. It's about you needing to give. And when people want to give me something, I guarantee you, I'm going to take, <laughs> amen. Not because of my need, but because I recognize how important it is for you to give. And let me speak specifically to those of you that are going to go out and become ministers that I struggled for decades in this area of finances. And we had bill collectors that were after us constantly. Um, it, we were turned over to collection agencies. And my heart was the same. I loved God and I was doing what God told me to do. But I used to be ashamed about giving and receiving an offering because I looked at it as it was for me. I didn't understand how this was so important for people. And for those of you that are going to be ministers, you need to break through this. And, and it's a heart attitude. I can't tell you if your heart's right in this or not, but if you go out and become bold in offerings because you see it as a way of you getting bigger offerings and more money for yourself, I think that's a wrong heart. But if you could start encouraging people to give because you really believe that this is what's going to help them. And if your heart's right in this matter, I guarantee you, you'll be a good minister and that'll make a difference in your life. Once I got this revelation, I've never been behind financially and God has supernaturally met our needs. And this man that I was talking about, that Ashley and Carly, they go to uh, his church and I went to his church. I saw him take people that were uh, out of prison. He used to be a policeman and because of his connections with the police, when people get in trouble and come out of prison, they will release him. They'll release these people to his uh, control and he will be responsible for him. And I saw him take this one guy named Terrence and he had just gotten out of prison. And I was there the day that he got out of prison and he was released to Pastor Dean's control. And so Pastor Dean says, I'm going to teach you how to prosper and I'm going to teach you how to succeed. And so he took his money and Dean always wears these fatigues that have these pockets all the way up and down the legs. And he carries, I don't know, five or six people's money in his pockets at all times and teaches them how to prosper. So he took Terrence's money from him, took his billfold and kept it. And while I was there that week, Terrence came one day and he said, Pastor Dean, could I have some money to go get something to eat? And he says, did you get up this morning to study the word and pray? 
And he says, well, you know, you kept me at church till one o'clock last night, cleaning up and doing things. And I had to get up and go to work. I didn't have time, but I said, I hadn't eaten any breakfast and, and it was lunch. And he says, could I have some money to go eat? And he said, no. He says, you can't have any money. And it was his own money. And Pastor Dean wouldn't let him have any money. He says, if you don't have time to get up and study the word and pray, you don't have time to eat. And you know, there's people that would criticize him. He's, he's quite the character. <laughs> he's something else. But did you know the next year when I came back, Terrence was making $10,000 a week. This man who came out of prison and was a zero going nowhere. Pastor Dean taught this man how to prosper. And he was making $10,000 a week. And I saw this happen so many times that finally I invited Pastor Dean to our Bible college. And I sat there and I said, I'm gonna learn what this man knows that I don't know. And I sat there for two days, three hours a day for two days and I never took a single note. He never said one scripture. He never said one thing that I didn't know. But the difference was he believed it. And I was... I had the fear of mammon. Ashley ministered about this in Orlando last week. That demonic spirit behind money. I was afraid of what people would say about me and that somebody would think I'm just out to get their money. And so I let the fear of other people. You know, Jesus said this in John chapter 5, verse 44. He says, how can you believe which receive honor one from another and seek not the honor that comes from God alone. If you are a man pleaser, if you have to have them validate you and a, their approval, and you're afraid to say anything that might ruffle somebody's feather, you cannot operate in God's kind of faith. You got to start getting to where you speak the truth. And I knew the truth about giving. Personally, Jamie and I have always given, and we've always walked in these things, but I was letting the fear of what people thought hinder me. And so I repented in sackcloth and ashes. I remember man uh, telling Pastor Dean that I have been fearful of man. I have not been telling people the truth because I, di I didn't realize how I was hurting people. And so I apologized. And you know, we were at that time holding meetings and we'd always invite Charlie and Jill LeBlanc to come and one other speaker and I would use a, uh, a church. I'd go into churches and they'd let me use their facilities and by the time I paid uh, an honorarium to Charlie and Jill and the other speaker and paid airfare and hotel and stuff, it was usually about $10,000. This is back in 96, I think it was. And so it was usually about $10,000 for a meeting. And we would, would come within five or $10 of being break even every single time. Sometimes I'd be $10 less than what it costs. Sometimes I'd be $10 more. And I looked at that as a win because uh, we would get partners through it. People would get drawn to the ministry. And so over a period of time, it always worked out. But it, I mean, it was just nearly always break even. Did you know that after that, the weekend after I listened to Pastor Dean and I apologized and recognized it wasn't about my need. It was about people and their need to give. The weekend after that, I went to Phoenix. I held a meeting just like always. I didn't tell people any different. I didn't use different scriptures to receive an offering, but the difference was I quit apologizing and telling people this is for your benefit. You need this. And did you know we went from like $10,000 in an offering to $25,000. And now we just receive. Matter of fact, Pastor Dean, every time he was around, I used to have him receive my offerings because he had received so much bigger offerings. Now, Pastor Dean, if he's ever around, ask me to receive the offerings because I receive bigger offerings than Pastor Dean does. And God set me free in this area. So those of you that are going to be ministers, you need to recognize that this isn't about your need. You don't need to present it about your need. You need to tell people about the benefit to them. Tell them that thus saith the Lord, your little cruise of oil and your oil will, your meal will not fail and God will meet all of your need. And so you need to stand as a minister and tell people that this is for your benefit. I can promise you this, that when we get to heaven, there's not a single one of you that's going to come to me and say, I wished you hadn't made me give so much money. <laughs> You're going to come up and hug me and thank me for getting this money out of your pocket because it's only what you give that you get to keep. 
Everything that you keep, I don't care what kind of house you buy, car you buy, clothes, jewels, anything, it's all going to pass away. But whatever you give away to the gospel to change people's lives, that will change their life. And someday in heaven, you'll have people lining up to come thank you for the way that you gave and changed their life. Man, if you understood this properly, your attitude would change from how much do I have to have in order to be a good steward, to take care of my family, to uh, be a good witness for the Lord, and how much can I possibly give away? With most people, it's just the opposite. They look at giving as a necessity, something they have to do, and they do it grudgingly and of necessity, and that does not bless God. So man, you need to change your heart and recognize it. Elijah wasn't taking from this woman. He was giving to her. I'm not taking from you today. I'm giving you an opportunity. I'm giving you an opportunity to, to release a portion of what God has given you and it will come back to you 100 fold. Amen. All right. So we've got ushers that are going to pass out offering envelopes. We're going to receive an offering today. This goes into the Karis general fund and it's used for multiple things. Primarily, we uh, use this for our missions trips. I don't even know what it costs, but the last I heard, it was over half a million dollars a year that we spend. It's probably closer to a million dollars a year that we spend subsidizing these missions trips, sending people around the world. So for you first year students, you're sowing into your future. Amen. And the way you give is the way that the next year's first class First year's class will give towards your expenses and to help you do things. So you'll reap this back a hundredfold in this life with your giving. Praise the Lord. Yep, you can text to give. Do they put that on the screen? Can you put that on the screen? I know we have this ability. I don't know how to do it, but... Somebody should have that ability up there. There it is. Amen. Praise God. And you know, just for your information, a lot of times people think, well, man, I paid tuition and stuff. And so why do I need to give any more? Did you know? I don't know exactly, but I have, we are in the process of trying to get some things ironed out. We don't know exactly how much Andrew Womack Ministries subsidizes uh, Karis, but it's at least $6 million a year. One of the figures, it could be up to $16 million a year I put into this. And that's not including the buildings. This is just our upkeep. If you talk about all the buildings that we've built, you didn't have to pay for any of those. I paid for all of these buildings out of my ministry and stuff. So anyway, my point is that tuition just doesn't even come close to covering all of the expenses. And so if you would like to give, there definitely is a place to use it. Amen. Unless you give a billion dollars, I've already got a place to spend it. And if you give a billion, I'll uh, probably, if you give more than a billion, I'll come up with a way to spend it pretty quickly. Amen. So anyway, I don't think you can out give my vision. Amen. And if you give me that much money out, my vision will just get bigger. That's all it'll have. Praise God. So Father, we love you and we're just so thankful for everything you've done. And Father, we thank you that you have spoken to us just like you spoke to this widow and you told us that you're going to supply our needs, but it's not going to come out of the sky. It's going to come as we give, that you will multiply it back to us. And so I pray for my brothers and sisters here. I pray especially, Father, for those that are in need today, that Father, they need, they may be down to their last little bit of food. Maybe this is their last little bit of money. Father, I pray that as they give today, that this multiplies back unto them supernaturally. I just speak in the name of Jesus that they are never going to be without, that they will never be without their rent. They will never be without gas money, without utilities, without food, without clothes, without all of the things that they need. I just say in the name of the Lord that you are supplying their need, that you are multiplying this seed back unto them 100 fold in this life. 
And Father, we thank you. We agree and we receive that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. You can receive the offering. You know, again, I could just give you so many testimonies in my life, but uh, man, you can't outgive God. If you give with the right heart, man, it's just going to come back and multiply greatly. Now, if you give with the wrong heart, uh, you just kill the return on your giving. But if you give with the right heart, I guarantee you it's going to come back. You know, Ashley and Carly are just a great example in this. Come up here again. I, we got four minutes left. I want you to share a little bit about some of your giving. You know, Ashley and Carly have only been out on their own for five years. They've already given our ministry $100,000, which, man, it took me 30 years before I gave anybody $100,000. What do you say about giving? Well, I was thinking about the time I gave a minister a gift. You know, I went to meet a minister for coffee. He's a mutual friend of ours. The first time I met him, and I believe that if you're going to receive something spiritual, you should give materially. So I wrote him out. I was going to write him out a $500 check, but I wrote him out a $1,000 check. I stretched my faith a few years ago, and, then, and I met him at the coffee shop, and he took my check, and he didn't even open it. He just put it in his pocket. And then um, he said to me, I've got an offering for you. And I thought, that's a strange thing to say. He's the man of God. I'm his junior, you know. But I, so I didn't know what to say, so I just, I was a bit awkward. I just said, well, I wonder whose offering's bigger then? I thought, what did I say that for? He didn't even laugh. He just went, hmm. So we sat down. He pulled out my offering, opened it up, looked at it. And he, he said to me, he said, my offering's bigger than yours. I thought, how does he know his offering's bigger? He doesn't know how much I've given. He got my offering, opened it, and he went, hmm. Got his checkbook out and wrote me a check for $4,000. Praise the Lord. I needed it at the time. I was happy. He said to me, actually, God told me whatever you give me today, I was to multiply it back to you four times. Isn't that good? Man, my first thought awesome. was, I'm glad I gave 1000 not 500 I already made $2,000 more. So anyway... <laughs> But he said to me, he said, he said, if you'd known that before we met, would it have changed how you gave to me? And I said, sir, it would have done, yeah. I mean, he said, how? I said, I would have got every bit of money I could have done. I said, I would have yeah. borrowed it from people, got it. Around. I said, I would have got every bit of money I could have done to give to you. And he said, oh. He said, we've got a problem then. He said, you don't really believe the word of God. He said, because the word of God tells us God only multiplies. It might not be instantly, but God only multiplies. He never takes. He always multiplies back to us every single time. So the best use of our money is to give into the gospel, praise God. So. so how many people want to increase your giving now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think you need to, I think we need to stretch ourselves. You know, I was just talking to a couple this weekend because some things uh, weren't working out in their ministry. And you know, the Lord showed me that anyone that has a powerful anointing on their ministry or a powerful anointing on their business, whatever it is that they're called to do, they're sacrificial givers. Not, I'm not talking about giving out of your abundance. Anyone can give out of their extra. Anyone can give out of something that they have left over. But the people that see the biggest anointing and the greatest miracle power of God working through them are people that are sacrificial givers. Amen. So how many of you want to sign up for that program? Amen. Come on, right? It's a stretch of faith. It's not about the money. God doesn't need our money, but he needs our heart. Amen. So I think, I think the Lord has given some of you an, of an opportunity this morning. So I'll tell you one more 30 second testimony. Yep. The 100,000 Andrew's talking about is a dream of mine. We'd always written out big checks by faith, not giving them. Just what would it be like to give $1,000? What would it be like to give $10,000? We put giving first. Giving was like our goal. So we wrote, we said, what would it be like to give 100,000? Well, a few years ago, we was able to do that. And we had to drain our savings account and our ministry completely. I mean, just gave it all away. We have big bills. I mean, I think we had like 20 staff at the time and television bills, day staff, TV and all that. But we just drained it. God told us to do it. So we gave it to Andrew. And, you know, after I gave it, I believe that the Lord tells you sometimes, you know, it's like he names your seed. And I said, Lord, what was that about? And he said, that's going to be a surprise one. That's going to... See, I believe your giving, your sacrificial giving can bring you things money could never buy. Your giving can bring you things money could never buy. So... Um, it's just a few years later, we needed premises for our ministry. We was borrowing um, offices from uh, Caris Christian Center. It was very thankful, but it was time we outgrew it. It was time to get our own place. And, um, you know, supernatural circumstances come about. A good friend of ours, a partner of ours, offered which us their would, place. Which would be me. <laughs> <laughs> offered us their, their home. And I is, gave them about a $100,000 discount. Oh, definitely. More than that, probably. So we got Andrew's old premises, 26 acres, his prayer trails, his rocks, everything. We had it professionally converted into offices, so it's no longer a house, it's now an office building. It's where we house Terra Des Ministries. 
And I was always where we put our TV studio in there. And I was walking Andrew's prayer trails, now my prayer trails. I was walking those prayer trails, praying, just thanking God. And God said, I told you I had a surprise for you. And that premises is worth about a million dollars. So that 100,000 we sowed, God wasn't taking from us. He was trying to get more to us. He was trying to release to us things. So you giving today, you, it's still time to go back there and increase it if you need to. But you're giving today. You write another check. Your giving today can bring you things money could never buy. Amen. Amen. And Thanks, they Andrew. got it all debt free. Debt free. We paid it off. Debt free. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Thanks, Andrew. You guys are a blessing. Thank you. Love you all. Love you. Love you. Isn't that awesome? And you know what? God will do it for them. He'll do it for you. He's no respecter of persons. All right. God bless you. You're dismissed. Doesn't stand a chance.